The battle over a huge Carmel Valley development shines a spotlight on the bare knuckles business of signature gathering. Advocates for more bike lanes clash with those who fear traffic lane closures will create chaos. And some Logan Heights residents surprise city planners by wanting to preserve an industrial corridor in the face of housing development. I'm Mark Sauer, and the KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer. And joining me at the roundtable today are KPBS Enterprise reporter Claire Tregesser. Hi, Claire. Hi, Mark. It's good to have you back. Reporter Dorian Hargrove with the San Diego Reader. Hi, Dorian. Hey, Mark. And reporter Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego. Hi, Andy. How's it going, Mark? Well, once again, the San Diego City Council has made a decision on a controversial issue, and once again, well-funded folks on the losing end are saying not so fast. Earlier this month, the council approved the massive one Paseo project in Carmel Valley, but area residents opposed to the project refused to give up the fight. They launched a petition drive, like several other groups have recently, and their aim bypassed city council and put the matter before voters. So, Claire, let's start with just kind of the overview, the scope of this project. It's a big one, right? Uh, yes, it's uh, mixed-use housing, office space, retail space. I think it's 23.6 acres, maybe one and a half million square feet. It would have 600 housing units in it. I think a movie theater, businesses, things like that. So it's a it's a real big one. I think the price tag is three quarters of a billion, 750 million. Yes. All right, Andy. Why are the uh, you've covered this story a long time? Why are the uh, folks up there uh, just not taking this lying down? Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing is traffic, which is usually the biggest opposition to any large development. They and again, tell us exactly where it is. So, and so it's right at the at Del Mar Heights and uh, El Camino and El Camino Real, oh, okay. right? So so it's like it's already a busy area. It's already a busy area. People would say it's already congested, and this is only going to make things worse. And it's it's uh, crucially about about Juan Paseo is that there's no transit serving it. So there's this big controversy about whether it's fair to call this smart growth or whether it's fair to call this the sort of development that the city's been pushing all over the city if, in fact, it isn't connected to transit. All right, and we're going to get into that in a moment, but we do have a, a clip of uh, Councilwoman Sherry Leitner. She's, uh, of course, in that district and one of those opposed on the council to this. Let's hear what she had to say, dropping off boxes this week of signatures. Once San Diegans learned that the approval of one Paseo was about more than Carmel Valley, that it might set a dangerous precedent for developers to bring massive new projects to their own communities. They added, they acted quickly to add their names to the cause. All right, well, how stirring that was, but uh, they do have a lot of petitions, do they not? How many do they need, and uh, where are they at on this draft? The number kept going up and up uh, on the, at the actual event where they dropped off the signatures. They said they had 55,000. I checked last night, it's up to 61,000 uh, signatures, to, which would put it on, on the ballot. I think they need 33,000 to actually get valid it. Valid ones right. when they go through and check. And check the interesting report. thing this time is that and I don't think that this has ever happened before. They, the opposing side, who is pro Juan Paseo, the backing the development. Yes, yeah. says that they have about half as many requests to remove signatures from the petition. So they went out, got people to sign, saying, "Oops, I signed this thing. I didn't really know what it was. I actually want to take back my signature." So the question is, how many of the people who signed those? actually signed in the first place, if they have enough, that could mean that it, that it won't qualify for the ballot. Sounds like a lot of fun for the uh, clerks who have to go through all this and sort this all out. So, Andy, there's another twist to this, right? The kind of the, the bogus campaign on the side, and explain what that's all about. Well, yeah, so they initially, I mean, they, they kind of Kilroyed the developer of this project, kind of just threw everything they had at it. Mm -hmm. Just and instead, of, instead of sitting back, we have the money. So instead of just sitting back and watching these our opponents gather as many signatures as possible, let's spend our money in whatever ways we can. And one of the ways they came up with was a, just a phony petition to uh, say, yes, I support the building a Chargers stadium. Um, but the real benefit of doing that wasn't anything. I mean, the signatures meant nothing. They couldn't have been less significant. But they were trying to compete by, by essentially stealing the signature gatherers themselves. So that mm -hmm. if they were working for them to collect those signatures, that meant they couldn't be working for, uh, for the opponents. Diluting the, the force trying right. to get yeah. the signature. And again, we should point out, these are, they get money for this. Uh, every signature yeah. is oh, money yeah, in the Oh, yeah, definitely. And I talked to Rachel Lang, who's the <clears throat> spokeswoman for the developers of the One Paseo Project. 
project. And she fully admitted, yeah, we we made up this petition not even ever really intending to collect signatures for it, just to be able to hire people to work for this Keep the Chargers in San Diego petition, and then they have those people reserved so that then they can send them out to get people to sign these rescission requests saying, take back mm -hmm. my, my signature. So that's a new twist and something that's become almost common here, and that is, as I said at the outset, you've got the city council, the elected representatives of the people making a decision, Somebody on the losing end of that doesn't like the decision, and so let's try and take it before the voters. And if, if my numbers are right, since 2013, just a short while ago, this is the fifth time this has happened. Right. Is that right? I checked into this, so this is the fifth one in San Diego since 2013. In all the other major cities in California, there have been four combined Total. since... 2012. So this is real popular here, and as we've just discussed, we got the other side coming in now and, and doing it well, too. Well, how about Dory? the numbers? I mean, I don't remember the numbers being this high for the minimum wage referendum and the other. I mean, this is the, are, oh, the number of signatures? of this, yeah, of the people signatures. Signing, it's yeah. Just, yeah, just kind of it's the minimum surprising wage that, was fifty six thousand, I think. So totally yeah, and they ended up having maybe twenty nine hundred rescission requests. So mm -hmm. clearly not nearly as mm -hmm. many rescission requests, but the number of signatures that they gathered. I think that's kind of standard that they want to get that many because they need to go so far over to be sure that, really? that the actual signatures are valid. I mean, I think what's really new that we're seeing here is there's money on both sides right. of the issue. Mm -hmm. right. and, and it c creates a completely different dynamic when there's not just, you know, when we had in Barrio Logan, when this went forward, there was there was a lot of money, financial support. That was the a community owners. plan that the, the industry wasn't happy with right. at the council. And the community that supported the plan just didn't have the firepower to go toe-to-toe -to -toe mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with mm -hmm. the shipyards. Uh, minimum wage, you would have thought maybe there was some union money that right. could have that could have combated, but it wasn't anywhere near as much really as happen. the Chamber of Commerce. And same thing with the linkage fee, which was a, a way to, to raise money for subsidized housing. Also, didn't have anywhere near the type of, of support to do this type of counter countermeasure. I All think right. it's also just Where? becoming now, you know, you talk to City Councilman Todd Gloria, he says, we're planning for these referendums. Mm -hmm. So the, f the finish line isn't getting it through the council, it's getting it through that referendum. And so now people, I'm sure Kilroy was planning all along, you know, once this passes the city council, if it passes, then we're going to have a referendum drive, and so we need to be prepared for that, so already have their plans underway for how to counter that. And Todd Gloria uh, wants to, to make it tougher. He wants to raise the bar, a few more hurdles for folks getting these petition drives together, right? Yeah, as part of the <clears throat> charter review process, he submitted this memo saying, let's look at the city charter rules for how referenda are done. Uh, there isn't a whole lot he can change at the city level. I think one of the things is he wants people who are against the referendum drive to be in the room when they're counting the signatures because right now it's only the people, yeah. so say the people who are against the minimum wage increase go out get signatures, they're the ones who get to be there when they count the signatures and he says both sides should be there to make sure everything's on the up and up I guess and also something that would make it so that you would know earlier who was funding the signature drives because I think in the case of the minimum wage it turned out that there were you know big restaurant lobbying groups behind the petition drive and people didn't know that while it was going on. Well we got a short time left but let me throw this out to the panel. This demands a lot on the voter right? You have to be pretty knowledgeable to see what is I'm signing, what's the the counter petition they want me to sign what's the issue yeah I mean there's stories <coughs> all over town of what the signature gathers are saying to get each signature and and that's been throughout these various campaigns we're describing right and, and every time there's been a legal challenge it's pretty much the, a judge has said you know look we I can't parse through whether each one of these people did or didn't know what they were signing it's just an impossibility so they pretty much just get it through all of which just reinforces the signature gathers incentives to say whatever they need to say to get each signature because you're getting paid per signature so. and it's right. not and it's not just kind of bending the truth that we, there's outright lies sometimes yeah. in some of these campaigns that we we've reported on and other mm -hmm. folks have reported on as well yeah 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 in this case there was a lot of reports that like uh, do you want a uh, Walmart to be built in Carmel Valley like to be clear this is like a high-end shopping center it is right. like far from a Walmart what right. about the cost to put it on the ballot does the city have to pay for that mm -hmm. yes yeah Ooh. but now that it goes it just goes to the next it used to be that the city would have to call a special election mm -hmm. and so that would make the city council oh, okay. back off more often when they were presented with these referendums um, now it just goes on the next one so if this one's successful it would go on June 2016 if the city council decides to hold their ground not back off of it along with mission minimum wage so we right, don't two referendums wage. Two. The same thing. Yeah. all right well we'll certainly be watching to see what happens and, and whether this gets established on the on the ballot or not
Going to turn now. The Logan Heights neighborhood just east of downtown San Diego has in place several features favored by those planning the city's future. The trolley runs through it with two stops. It's centrally located and ripe for gentrification with old industrial businesses being replaced by new housing. And there isn't a groundswell of residents opposing city smart growth idea as there are in other neighborhoods. But Andy, you wrote this week that many in Logan Heights uh, still are not uh, uh, crazy about this whole idea. What's going on? Well, so, yeah, so it's it, you had kind of a weird situation that's just different than what the city has encountered elsewhere where they've proposed sort of up zones. You know, in Moran, on Morena Boulevard, they went through this, this process and got a huge amount of community opposition. In Grantville, it's been kind of the same thing where they've done this same, this same type of you know, increase the amount of new housing that can be built here, try to make it all built around the trolley, connect people in a way that they don't have to be so reliant on their cars. The um, idea is to stop sprawl, to get more right. dense and around transit Build centers. where we've already decided to build and then and build where we can up, move people in and, and out. Move people right. in and out efficiently. And so, you know, the city got $500,000 from Sandeg specifically to write up a plan in this area that was based around this principle. And th meanwhile, they're going all, all, all around the city proposing these ideas everywhere. They're not getting that type of opposition. It's not an opposition to density, per se, in this case. There is a fear, though, that if you improve the community and if you provide these things that people do want, that it won't be them who gets to benefit. They'll, they'll, they'll end up getting pushed out and displaced. They'll get priced out of their own they'll neighborhood. They'll get priced out of their own neighborhood. So you get a, it's a very different dynamic wow. than you've seen elsewhere. Wow. So they're against it, but for a very different reason. Oh, and you've got... Well, and, well, be, so, let me, let me I, I want to say that they're not against it. They're, okay. they're, they're for it, but there is some fear they're about what's going to happen. All right. Let me uh, do a little uh, uh, housekeeping here. Tell us specifically the area we're talking about in this community so, so the it's, audience it's, has it. They, they, they got money for the commercial and imperial corridor running just east of downtown. So there's the first two trolley stops on the orange line, right when you get out of downtown, or right through this neighborhood. Um, and if you go down there now on commercial, so they, they have done exactly what you would expect in terms of zoning right around the, the station at 25th Street, 25th and commercial. There's another one at 32nd Street, which right now, if you go over there, I mean, it is, it is, it is bleak. It's desolate down there. It's just uh, auto wrecking shops, junkyards, uh, metal scrapping facilities, recycling yards, and then there's a trolley stop. And it's and the, the, you know this is not a, a a job center. This is not a you know this isn't high end manufacturing the type of jobs that President Obama talks about wanting to mm -hmm. to build up to to reestablish the middle class. This is a few jobs m at the at these very small areas. So like scrap metal scrap plants, metal plants. Uh, auto, um, and they're metal. and they're right next to homes. I mean you've got homes tucked in between this this rabble of of situations there. And yet the city has decided not to rezone that industrial area and try to encourage it to become this idea of mixed-use urban development, despite its proximity downtown and despite the trolley stop. Well, uh, give us a little bit about the demographics. So who are the folks who, who live there? What's that it's neighborhood predo like Predominantly Mexican-American community, lower income, significantly lower income than the working rest class of the city. Working-class neighborhood. Yeah, yeah certain working-class neighborhood. And that's, and that's exactly the point, is like the, these jobs are very often downtown. These are uh, the hotel workers. These are the, the, you know, in many cases, the shipyard workers down in Barrio Logan. And they, it's very practical for them to use public transit to get down there and not have to rely on a car if the city would develop it. Uh, and now this kind of, uh, it seems to me, from reading your story, it caught uh, the council member for that district, uh, M Mr. Alvarez, David yeah. Alvarez, of course, ran for mayor in our special election here <clears throat> in, in the neighboring community of Barrio Logan on the whole idea that we want this community plan that will improve it and gentrify the area and change. But he was kind of caught unawares by some of the sentiment you're describing in, in Logan Heights. Yeah, I mean, I think he just he just assumed, well, we're rewriting the plan for this area. We've got this large citywide initiative that this is the type of thing we're pushing for. Why wouldn't, at this 32nd Street area, why wouldn't we change these development restrictions? So then when they didn't, he was, he was definitely surprised. I should say, uh, you know, as a requirement for environmental review for these plans, you have to have some alternatives. And one of the alternatives does... Uh, study the the possibility of making it mixed use instead of industrial so he said basically you know that's something i would be prepared to support when this eventually comes forward for mm -hmm. city to city council claire is that, is that standard that a council member would just stay out of i read in your story that he mm -hmm. said he didn't want to influence it is that usually the way that that goes do you know uh yeah so the way he said is you know in the early process it is it 
it is time for, for me to stay out. And he said, this is basically the end of the early process. It's going to come out of, community, uh, out of environmental review, so now is a good time for me to start discussing what I would like from a, a policy side. I, I think it would be fair to ask whether that's the best way. He, I mean, what he's saying is, we don't need politics meddling in with city functions at the early phase. Let, let city planners do their jobs, their professionals, let the community have its chance for input without without you know political actors starting to meddle in the situation. Now, the, the alternative to that, or the, an alternative way to look at it is, well, we're spending a lot of money here. If they're not doing something you're ready to support, maybe you could weigh in a little bit earlier and, and, and start exerting your influence. Because if you're not gonna support it, well, there's not really that much reason to spend a million dollars in four years of time getting to this point in the first place. Because it still has to go through the city council, Yeah, it's all right? ultimately gonna right. have to be. Approved. All right, a few seconds left with this one. Uh, the other uh, neighborhoods, is some neighborhood gonna be the model for this? If it's not the three we're talking about today, if it's not uh, this area, where yeah. are we gonna get the smart growth uh, example? Yeah, I mean, right now, basically, you, you're getting it in you're, you're basically getting it in downtown, and there is, without much planning underway, there is a lot of it happening in Mission Valley. Okay. Mission Valley right now is sucking up a lot of the city's development needs. So we, we may see the smart growth model there at some point. Of course, yeah, and, and it's, it's an open discussion that whether that's the best place for it necessarily, right. as opposed right. to somewhere like this. This is much closer to downtown. But in, in the absence of any sort of uh, plan from above, developers are kind of stepping into the void and it's really happening in Mission happening Valley. There. All right, we'll move on. The car culture is as much a part of our region as sunshine and fair weather. And it's all those sunny days, of course, that also make this a paradise for bicycle riders. The conflict comes where the rubber meets the road. Cars and bikes don't meld easily. Bikes are favored by planners these days in the push to limit the burning of fossil fuels due to climate change. But some leaders say bike advocates are going too far. And this conflict is embodied within two bike lane proposals and uh, Dorian, since we're sitting right here on the SDSU campus, campus, let's start with the one just a few blocks from where we are here today from the studio uh, along the College Avenue. Tell us about the, that proposal. So it's called the South Campus Plaza Project and it's a 18 acre development and it'll house I think 1600 students along with retail and commercial space and some open green. Whole mixed use project. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And what, what they want to do is they, they want to turn, because it is, you know, pretty much adjacent to the college, I mean, it is the college, right. they want to turn it into, you know, more of a pedestrian bike area right in front. Um, so they've come up with, with uh, they, well, they basically abandoned their one plan of, of addressing traffic out front and kind of move towards a biking walking more pedestrian type of friendly so, project. So that you've got that coming up from Interstate 8, just to tell folks it's south of Interstate 8, it would come up the hill and College Avenue is already very busy mm -hmm. and they want to take some of that the space that's for vehicular traffic now and turn it into bike lanes and pedestrian yes. area and crowd that even further and there's some people who aren't keen on that. Yeah, well, you know, the, 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 the original plan is part of the project in order to mitigate for the traffic because, I mean, obviously everyone knows that drives around the college that I mean, right there is a very busy spot, especially mm -hmm. trying to get onto the eight or get off of the eight. Right. So the, the in the beginning, it was planned that the lanes would go from two lanes each way to three lanes, and that would That's be the, for cars. That yes, yeah. uh, sorry, and and that would be the mitigation. So that would be the way to address the traffic impacts. Somehow, and this happened kind of you know unbeknownst to to some residents, is that um, the college uh, changed their plan and they and they moved into this more bike friendly alternative. The alternative wasn't even listed in the environmental impact report. So obviously you can imagine residents. They say, uh, hey, you pulled a fast one here. What's, yeah. what's going on? And of course, leading the, the leading voice on that is council member Mar Marty Emerald. And what's she got to say? What's her, what's her beat? So, you know, she, she's standing with the, with the residents and she says, you know, to make sure that in her office, make sure to tell me as well that, you know, she is supportive of bike lanes. I mean, there's no question that that just not like when that, they want to yeah, be built. That <laughs> no, on your well, story. no, the, the <laughs> process, the, the concept, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of bike lanes, <laughs> except in, in David two, Alvarez's district. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, except in this two-block area. Okay. I mean, just because of its proxy, you know, I mean, really, anyone going north on College, yeah. they're either uh, they're not going to get on the eight on a bike, and they're you know, or they're going into Del Cerro. Well, well and it, let's face it, it's a big hill. I uh, I actually uh, tried to ride a bike. Claire may remember I had an electric it's bike an electric even, bike. and I cheated, <laughs> and I got rid of that. It's a big hill. Wouldn't even, yeah, wouldn't even make it up the KPB. hill. I wouldn't even get me up the hill <laughs> on either side of the freeway. So so, so yeah. she she says adamantly she wants bike. She you know she wants bike lanes in all of her district besides this two block area and the, where you know, they're being proposed. Going yeah. going you know on Montezuma <laughs> or some other way to 
connect them to yeah. the college area. You know, and, and obviously you have residents that say, you know, this this whole this whole thing is only going to create more emissions. It's not going to reduce them because cars are going to be sitting idling, w- you waiting know. for the traffic lights, and then forever to get down the hill and on to. Uh, it's because there's going to be a, a development further down the hill, right? That's that's the plan. That why more people will be coming that way. Or? Well, I mean, I think that development alone, as well, you know, that'd be further be, north toward I. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, there's obvious need already, and and actually, in 1989, it was part of the city's plan to in, increase this, increase the number of lanes, mm-hmm. and then in 2013, the city came out with a bike regional bike plan, I believe, or master plan. And that called for wider bike lanes there. So there's some conflict of, you know, regardless of development, it's always been on their radar. But the cycling folks, the cycling advocates say, we need this. This has got to happen. This is the overall plan. This is the future, right? Yeah. And, you know, they they say as far as increased lanes, they call it uh, induced demand, I believe is what they they call it. And with increased lanes comes increased traffic. Mm -hmm. And it's harder, more difficult, or, or I'm saying more dangerous, I should say. For a cyclist, if the lane, if the roads are bigger, so well, and ultimately you just get you just get the same idling that you would get. It just it just takes a little while for the for the market to react and start filling up those lanes, and that yeah. t- tends to be what you see. All right, before we we leave this one, I move to the other area where there's another cons, uh, controversy. Where does this conflict in the college area stand now? What's the status? So, because the the way that it was done, as far as just the the change put into development services department and not part of the environmental impa- impact report, there's going to be some some back and forth. So the city has the plan now. They're going to comment on it and then give it back to the college. The college will then decide, uh, or you know, will then come back. So there has to be some sort of agreement eventually reached. All right, let's shift to the other fun one, and that's the Hish- uh, Hillcrest Mission Hills area, and it's a plan to close a section of University Avenue. Uh, tell us what section we're talking about. What's the what's the overall idea there? So it's actually part of a much larger bike plan from Sandag, and uh, Sandag is is using transportation, uh, what is it, Transnet funds, uh, to pay for this. I think it's two hundred million dollars. For the, for the whole regional bike plan, the Uptown Bikeways project is a specific link of this, right? So what they want to do overall is connect Old Town to Uptown to Mission Valley to Downtown to North Park. And there's one specific part in Uptown where they want to take away the on and off ramp onto University from Washington Avenue, which is a pretty busy little area. They want to take, they remove the on and off ramp and then close portion just two block portion of university to make it full just pedestrian area. And where do the cars go at that point? Well, so they'll go on to Washington and then they can make a right and get back onto university, you know, if they were, they can get back on the permanent detour around that. So and university down through into Hillcrest will also be more pedestrian friendly. So cars might be, you know, there'll be cars on there, but it'll be either a dedicated raised bike path or some sort of way where, you know, bicyclists really do have you know, uh, a safe option. And we've got the same thing going on there. The cyclists are, are all for it, and the residents there say, no, it'll be a traffic nightmare case. You know, for, for the residents of Mission Hills, they, they're, they're saying that really Washington Avenue is just jammed Washington already. Street. Or, yeah, yeah it's, it's just jammed already. Mm-hmm. There's two major hospitals there. There's um, a lot of businesses. Yeah. A lot of businesses, and and you know, and then they say that that with with more traffic having to be diverted, it's going to ruin their property values and everything else. Um, it, you know, and and obviously the cyclists want this, mm-hmm. so it's a it's a it's a definitely a debate. And, and yeah, like, go ahead, Claire. Well, it's interesting because the city has this climate action plan right. where it's supposed to be what is it? Cycling as commuting is supposed to go from one to eighteen percent or six 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 percent by twenty twenty, and then okay. eighteen by twenty. Yeah, how are we going to do that if we don't encourage yeah, every riding. time that there's an idea of okay, let's make it safer for bicyclists? Because I think that's one of the main reasons that people don't like to ride mm-hmm. just to get around the city mm-hmm. is. It feels dangerous, but yeah. then every time we're saying, "Okay, let's do it here," people say, "No, no, not here." Yeah. I like it in general, but that's yeah, that, not that's, here. and that's the thing you see recurring all across the city and all kinds of issues is people who are happy to support something in the abstract, mm-hmm. and then in any specific instance of it, when there is an actual affected party who stands against it, being unwilling to to tell them essentially 
tough. And and you just see you see it with density, you see it with bike lanes, you see it with transit. Everybody likes the concept of these things and recognizes the regional need to encourage these things, but no one is ever able to stand up to local interests. Classic well, one, NIMBY, not in my backyard. Well, one of the major issues they have, and Sandag hasn't addressed it, was that this this whole project, just in the uptown area alone, from from Washington to uh, I think Normal Street in Hillcrest, will remove 33 percent of the parking in uptown. That's so it's a issue. major, yeah. major blow to parking. That's so obviously, impact, you know, yeah. you have some Hillcrest business owners saying, hey, you know, we're already strapped when it comes right. to parking. Yeah, parking's already a nightmare in that area. Yeah, and you know, then you have the cyclists saying, well, if you make it more pedestrian friendly, you're going to have more options because people are going to be slower and, you know, that want to make Hillcrest kind of a... All right, a couple day. seconds left. What's the status of this one? When are we going to resolve San Diego this? still has a, a bunch of work to do with meetings, and, okay. they, and then they'll go to... Um, They'll go to an environmental impact All right, report. so a lot more voices to be heard. All right, well, that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Claire Tregesser of KPBS News, Dorian Hargrove with the San Diego Reader, and Andrew Keats of Voice of San Diego. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable.